I think the core challenge facing the health service during the lifetime of this parliament, the first half of the decade, is what uh, we on the Health Select Committee summarise as the Nicholson Challenge, named after Sir David Nicholson, Chief Executive, because he first articulated it with, in, in, with great clarity just before the last general election, in fact, 12 months before. And it arises because the budget available for health care is effectively flat during the lifetime of this parliament, but demand will continue to rise by 4% per annum. So for the first time in its history, the health service, if it's going to meet demand for health care, needs to increase efficiency by 4% per annum, four years running. 4% efficiency gain, four years running, is what I call the Nicholson Challenge. But you also pointed out that that's never been achieved before by anyone. Indeed. The, the context is that in the NHS, we've never delivered 4% in one year, never mind four, and nobody anywhere has ever delivered 4% efficiency gain four years running. Now, that means that it's a, an unprecedented challenge, but it isn't the same thing as saying it's impossible. And what I went on to say this morning uh, is that uh, I think that you can deliver that kind of efficiency gain and accompany efficiency gain with improved quality if you set out to address things that we've been talking about for a quarter of a century, probably longer in the health service, about the need to rebalance and restructure the way care is delivered so that it's more community-based, it's more patient-focused, and it's less dependent on a series of silos that have independent budgets uh, with independent lines of accountability and without proper collaboration between them. Now, the Health Select Committee's recommendations recognise that some of the reforms will achieve that, but that some should be tinkered with from Andrew Lansley's ideas, one being that the way commissioning is set up should change. Could you explain that to us? I think there are several changes I would like to see. The first, actually, ironically, I don't think is a change. I think Andrew Lansley has always understood uh, the importance of having proper accountability and so forth for the commissioning decisions, but has wanted to leave the precise shape of that uh, to the commissioning board. Now, I actually don't think he's right to leave it to the commissioning board. I think we're talking here about huge sums of public money spent on a, a service which is where there's a very high degree of public interest. And I think, therefore, it is important that the, that the accountability and governance structures that surround the commissioning process should be fit for purpose. We need to remember that the average budget of a commissioning consortium will be a quarter of a billion pounds. It's several times larger than the budget of the largest district health authority, a district council. And we wouldn't contemplate a world where district councils didn't have public access to papers, didn't have proper conflict of interest rules, didn't meet in public. And so we should apply the same principles of high standards of public, of public sector governance to these questions around the management and shaping of the health service as we do in the rest of the public sector. And importantly, you believe that commissioning should be clinically led, but not just by primary care clinicians. Uh, um, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think if you ask yourself the question why commissioning hasn't worked as effectively as we'd hoped uh, during the 21 years now since it was introduced in 1990, one of the principal reasons for its weakness has been the, uh, the, the sense on the part of large sections of the clinical community that they're not involved in it. So engaging clinicians in the process of commissioning is absolutely fundamental to success in my view. Uh, now, the, the government definitely, uh, clearly recognises that by the, insta by the uh, vesting it in the GP consortia. Uh, and indeed, in all the speeches, again, there's no conflict of objective here. It's always been recognised by GPs and by the government uh, that it needs to go beyond simple GP engagement. Uh, but I think, actually, we need to move beyond it in the, f in, in the form of these authorities as well. And we need to make it clear that it's GP-led, it's led from the community perspective, which is where it should be led from, but it needs to engage the hospital clinicians, the nursing professions, the wider clinical community. Now, you have caused a bit of a headache for Andrew Lansley in making these slightly alternative recommendations. Is it too late to turn this reform tanker around? 
well, I don't think it's a question of turning it round, actually. I think this is a, a question of the uh, extent to which it's evolutionary, rev revolutionary. I'm very clear that the prime drivers of these changes are the same as the prime drivers uh, going back to 1990, I'm fond of saying. Uh, this is an evolution of policy that's been conducted by every single uh, Secretary of State for Health since 1990, with the single exception of Frank Dobson. And so importantly, what is your opinion of the two controversial areas of competition and the timing of reform? Well, the timing, I think, is easy and has been resolved already, to be honest. Uh, the, uh, David Nicholson has made it crystal clear that he won't be authorising new uh, commissioning uh, consortia uh, unless he's satisfied uh, that they're competent and, and properly structured and able to do the job, and he'll only be authorising them to the extent uh, that they're competent and properly structured to do the job. So in other words, A, that there's the co introduction of the concept of partial authorization, and B, equally importantly, there's the concept of deauthorization as well, if a commissioning authority doesn't achieve uh, proper standards. So that's, a, I think, the, the, the concept of a cliff edge has actually disappeared from the substance of the policy, although we clearly need to have, uh, there need to be clearer answers, I think, in the legislation or in the surrounding policy around how you manage areas where there isn't full authorization of the commissioning consortium. Uh, on competition, uh, I was asked a question about that. I think that it's, it, consider the counterfactual. Should a commissioner with a huge sum of public money at disposal be deaf to a proposal that this might be a better way of solving these, the problems of these particular patients. That seems to me to be an absurd proposition and actually an improper uh, proposition when you're spending public money. The question is not whether, there should be, whether commissioners should be open to alternative solutions. The question is whether the commissioning process should be transactional, that is to say you hold competition for every single transaction you conduct, or whether it's a competition for solutions and i very strongly in favour of the second approach, not the first. So you wouldn't agree with the BMA that this is akin to the selling off of the energy bodies? I, it's not true to say that I've never agreed with the BMA. I've always sought to find agreements, agreement, the scope for agreement with the BMA, but nobody's talking about selling off anything. And finally, would you like to be Health Secretary again? I've been asked that question repeatedly, and I've always given the same answer, which is that I've been elected to do a job for a parliament in the Health Select Committee. I'm very proud to be doing that job. We have an excellent Secretary of State and I've made it clear that I'm not pursuing that job. Stephen Doyle, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.